Today's video is sponsored by one of the best turn-based RPGs of all time, Raid Shadow Legends. Raid is an awesome, epic, dark fantasy where you collect heroes in a turn-based game. One of the best parts about Raid is that there are so many ways to play it. There's Campaign Mode, which is a fully voiced story, and it's where you get experience points for your characters. My favorite way to play is the Dungeon Mode. In this mode, you can fight against 10 different bosses, and if you defeat them, you get artifacts that make your champion stronger. I love Raid Shadow Legends because it has great visual effects. Just look at how awesome these graphics are. You also get daily rewards that make leveling up easy. And now, you can finally play Raid on your desktop. The game is cross-device, so you can download it and play it with the same user and switch between Mac, PC, mobile, and tablet whenever you want and however you want. So what are you waiting for? Go to the video description, click on the special links, and you'll get 50,000 silver and a free champion as part of the new player program to start your journey. Good luck, and I'll see you there. Number 3. Paulette Burleson The first New Mount Calvary Baptist Church was established in 1917 in the 5th Ward in Houston, Texas. In 2008, 42-year-old Tracy Burleson became the pastor of the church. Not everyone in the congregation was happy that Tracy was made the pastor. Over the next two years, two-thirds of the congregation left the church. In March 2009, several church members filed a 37-page complaint to get Tracy removed as pastor. They accused him of violating church bylaws and mishandling the church's finances. Also, Tracy was married to a woman named Paulette Burleson, but it was rumored that he was having extramarital affairs. However, the complaint did not manage to get Tracy removed as pastor. A year after the complaint was filed, he still held the position. In April 2010, the police were called out to the Burleson's home in Houston Lake. A man had tried to attack 53-year-old Paulette Burleson with a baseball bat. No arrests were made in the attempted assault. A month later, at about 2.30 a.m. on May 12, 2010, a fire broke out at the First New Mount Calvary Baptist Church. The fire ravaged the 93-year-old church and the roof collapsed. There was very little that could be salvaged from the charred remains of the church. An investigation into what caused the fire was started. Six days after the fire, on the night of May 12, 2010, the police were again called to the Burleson's home. Tracy Burleson said they had come home and he found his 53-year-old wife lying in a pool of blood on their driveway. Paulette was pronounced dead at the crime scene. She had been shot once in the back of the head. When the police arrived at the crime scene, they found Tracy's car running and the driver's door was open. It looked like he had just jumped out of his car. The police interviewed Tracy and he said that after dinner, Paulette went outside to watch the sunset. Tracy said that he drove to a nearby convenience store and bought some snacks. When he came home, he found Paulette lying in the driveway. He said that he called 911 immediately and that he held his wife and prayed for her. Tracy told the police that he thought his enemies of the church had killed Paulette. But the police doubted that members of a church would kill their pastor's wife just because they didn't like the pastor. The police thought it might have been a random act of violence like a drive-by shooting. But not everyone thought that the crime was random. One of those people was Paulette's son, John Ross. 
Ross was Paulette's son from a previous relationship. Ross told the police that he had heard that the church was in serious financial trouble. He heard that Tracy had gotten his son, 20-year-old William Fuller, to burn down the church for insurance money. William was Tracy's son from a previous relationship. He had been living with his father and stepmother since he was 12. John Ross said that his mother probably found out that William had set the fire and she was killed to silence her. The police decided to investigate Ross's theory about his mother's murder. They found out that the church was in financial trouble. They also learned that Tracy had been unfaithful to his wife. He had many affairs and not just with women. He also had sexual relationships with men and transvestites. Often, he would have these affairs in the church. In fact, Paulette had caught him several times. While Tracy had many affairs in the past, for just over a half a year, he had been seeing one woman, 31-year-old Tyon Palmer. The police decided to interview Tracy's son, William Fuller. The police tracked down William. They found him at Tyon Palmer's home. It turned out that William had been living with Tyon and her three children since late 2009. William had sickle cell anemia and Tyone was acting as his caregiver. She would do things like bring him to his doctor's appointments. One day, a few weeks after William moved in to Tyon's home, William brought Tyon with him to the church's family day. That's where Tyon and Tracy met for the first time. Days later, they started a sexual relationship. Tracy had promised Tyon that he would get divorced for Paulette and marry her. The police brought William in for questioning and after a few minutes, he broke down. He said that shortly after he moved in with his father and stepmother when he was 12 years old, they started verbally and physically abusing him. He also said that his father and stepmother would get into physical altercations with each other. At times, they would even grab knives and slash at each other. William said that one time, he was cut on the arm while trying to break up one of their knife fights. William claimed that after he graduated high school in 2008, his father first suggested killing Paulette. William said that over the next two years, his father pestered him and abused him to try to make him kill his stepmother. After his father started dating Tyon, he began to increase the pressure. His father had told him because of Paulette's religious convictions, she would probably fight him on the divorce. His father said the only way to get rid of Paulette was to kill her. Then his father explained that after Paulette was dead, he was going to collect $60,000 from a life insurance policy. William said that his father offered to pay him $2,000 if he killed Paulette. So William finally agreed to kill his stepmother. William said that on the night of May 12th, his stepmother was sitting outside. His father came outside and started a loud argument with her. William said they snuck up on Paulette from behind as she argued with his father and then he shot her once in the back of the head. Then his father set up his car to make it look like he just got home and he called 911. Meanwhile, William called Tyon and told her what happened. She picked him up and then they drove to a bridge. William said that he threw the gun off the bridge into the water below. Then William made a shocking admission. 
Yi said that two days after the murder, he had sex with Tai An for the first time. He claimed they had never had sex before, and it was the start of their sexual relationship. After interviewing William, the police went to the bridge where William said he tossed the gun. It turned out that William had missed the water and the police found the gun beside the stream. On June 6, 2010, about three weeks after the murder, Tracy Burleson and Tyon Palmer were both arrested. The police found them in bed together. William made a plea deal to testify against both Tracy and Tyon. In exchange, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. In September 2011, Tracy Burleson went to trial. He denied having anything to do with the murder of his wife. William testified against his father. He explained, for years, he had been abused by his father and stepmother. He testified that he shot his stepmother while his father distracted her. Tracy's lawyer argued that the motive was a lurid work of fiction. He said there was no way that a father, who was a pastor, would hire his own son to kill his wife so that he could be in a relationship with another woman whom the son was also in a sexual relationship with. Instead, they argue that William was jealous of his father for dating Tyon and he hated his stepmother for abusing him. By killing his stepmother and blaming his father for the murder, he was getting his revenge. William admitted that he did hate his stepmother and he was happy she was dead. He said if he was given another chance, he would kill her again. The defense pointed out that William had a name tattooed on his neck. That name was Tyon. William admitted that he had been in a sexual relationship with his dad's girlfriend, but he claimed he wasn't jealous. He said that he loved Tyon, but was platonic. The defense had a significant problem with Tracy's alibi. Tracy said that he was at a convenience store buying snacks when his wife was shot. He claimed he came home and found her dead on the driveway. But the police learned that the convenience store was closed at the time of the shooting, so Tracy was lying about his alibi. The prosecution also showed evidence that he and Tyon had been having an affair. The prosecution argued that this would have been motive for Tracy to have his wife killed. Tracy Burleson was ultimately convicted of capital murder and he was sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole. Tyon Palmer went to trial a month later in October 2011. Tyon claimed she didn't know anything about the murder until after it was committed. But William testified that she and her father had planned the murder and they both had encouraged him to carry out the hit. Tyon was found guilty of first degree murder, which is a lesser charge than capital murder in Texas. As a result, she was sentenced to seven years in prison. It was determined that the fire that destroyed the 93-year-old First New Mount Calvary Baptist Church was an act of arson. No one has ever been charged in connection to the church arson, but strongly believe that Tracy Burleson and his son, William Fuller, were responsible for the fire. Number 2. Paul Spickett On the morning of February 13, 1974, a milkman was driving near Sedgefield, which is a small town in northwest England. He saw something unusual on the side of the road. He decided to investigate, and it turned out to be the dead body of a young boy. The police were called, and very quickly, 
They identify the body as 10-year-old Paul Spickett. The police and the people in the community where Paul lived, Thornaby, have been looking for him after he didn't come home from school two days earlier. Initially, the police thought that Paul had been slashed and stabbed in the face and neck area. But it turned out that he had been hit seven times with a blunt object, like a hammer. The medical examiner determined that Paul had been killed two days earlier and his body had recently been dumped. Paul's body was found about 10 miles from his home. The police launched an investigation into the brutal murder and what they uncovered was genuinely unusual. At the time of the murder, Paul's mother, 44-year-old Kathy Spickett, had been dating a 38-year-old man named Brian Adams. What Kathy didn't know was that Brian was married and he was living with his wife. Brian's wife was a 29-year-old woman named Isabel. Brian and Isabel Adams got married nine years earlier in 1965. Brian was a bus driver and Isabel had been a teacher. It wasn't long after they wed that Brian strayed from the marriage. He had several affairs with different women. He even got another woman pregnant. Isabel knew about her husband's infidelities, but she remained faithful to him. They had four children together, and they lived in a house in Stockton on Tees. Although Brian had a wife and four children, he still did not feel like settling down. Brian worked as a bus driver, and in 1973, while he was working, he met a conductress named Kathy Spickett. They eventually started dating each other. But there was a problem. Brian did not think that Kathy would want to be with him if she knew he was married. So Brian convinced his wife Isabel to pretend that they were not married so he could date Kathy. Brian and Isabel told Kathy that Brian's wife had died in a car accident and Isabel was a sister who was a widow. They told Kathy that after the death of Isabel's husband, she had moved in with Brian with her two children, and she was also taking care of Brian's two children as well. But, in reality, Brian and Isabel were the parents of all four children. Because of the way Brian and Isabel acted together, Kathy had no reason to doubt their story. In fact, Kathy, Brian, and Isabel would all go out together to the pub for the evening. When they were done, Kathy and Brian would go back to Kathy's home together and then Isabel went to the home that she shared with Brian and took care of their four children. Brian and Isabel even introduced Kathy to their children. To maintain their cover story, when Kathy was around, Brian and Isabel made their children refer to them as aunt and uncle. But then, one day, Kathy found something she thought was quite odd. It was a letter from Isabel to Brian. The letter starts off with a salutation, My darling Brian. Isabel later writes, You are a wonderful husband and father. Kathy asked Isabel about the letter, and Isabel wrote her a letter to explain. Isabel wrote that she knew that the letter was odd, but she just wanted Brian to know that she was thankful for taking care of her and her children after her husband died. In the same letter, Isabel wrote that she thinks that Kathy and Brian are the ideal couple. When the police interviewed Isabel Adams, she admitted that she had picked up Kathy's 10-year-old son, Paul Spickett, from school. She took him back to her home and then struck him seven times with a hammer. She then hid his body in an upstairs cupboard. Isabel swore that her husband had nothing to do with the murder. 
When Brian was interviewed by the police, he said it wasn't quite that simple. He said he didn't know that Isabel was planning on killing Paul and that she had committed the murder on her own. When he came home, Isabel said, He's upstairs, dead. I did it for you, because of you. Brian said he went upstairs and found the body. Brian told the police that the next night, he dumped the body on the side of the road. He then went and joined the search for Paul to throw suspicion off himself and his wife. Brian told the police, My wife wanted me to be happy and would do anything for me. I know that my carrying on the way I did drove her to do this. Brian and Isabel Adams were both arrested. In July 1974, for his role in the murder, Brian was sentenced to a year in prison. Isabel pleaded not guilty to murder, citing diminished responsibility. Instead, in agreement with the prosecution, she pleaded guilty to manslaughter. On July 8, 1974, she was sentenced to life in prison. Number 2. Diane Delia On October 28, 1981, a body wrapped in a blanket was found floating in the Hudson River in New York City. The body was pulled out of the river and the police discovered it was a woman's body. She was fully clothed, but she had no identification on her. The medical examiner determined that she had been shot in the head four times. As the medical examiner was doing the autopsy, he discovered that the woman had formerly been a man. This made the police investigation into her identity quite easy. A 24-year-old trans woman named Diane Delia had been reported missing from Yonkers. She was last seen alive three weeks earlier. Diane Delia had been born John Delia. She had undergone sexual reassignment surgery about a year before her murder. Before and after her surgery, Delia was well known at a disco called Zippers. At the disco, she did female celebrity impersonations. She was apparently excellent at imitating soul singing legend Diana Ross. In fact, when she chose her new name, she picked Diane in honor of Diana Ross. The police investigated Delia's personal life and they uncovered a messy tangle of relationships. Delia had been an openly gay man since the age of 21. But Delia felt that he was female, so he started to have plastic surgery and he took hormones to look more feminine. Then, in late 1979, he met a 24-year-old woman named Robin Arnold. Arnold was the daughter of a well-to-do doctor and she worked as a nurse. She also had an $80,000 inheritance from her grandfather, who was a pediatrician. Celia found himself attracted to Arnold and they started dating. After a few months, they were engaged to be married. But then, in the fall of 1980, Delia concluded that he was truly meant to be a woman. Arnold supported his decision and even paid for Delia's sexual reassignment surgery. After Delia became a woman, she and Arnold broke off their relationship. Delia moved to Montreal, Quebec, Canada, and she got a job as a hostess in a nightclub. She also tried to launch her modeling career. She managed to get a job as a model for Avon Products. A photograph of her wearing a nylon bathrobe was printed in one of their catalogs. After several months in Montreal, Delia moved back to New York City. 
In August 1981, Delia married a 22-year-old man named Robert Ferreira. Delia and Ferreira had dated when Delia was a man. Ferreira was a bartender and he had met Delia while he was working. Robin Arnold supported the marriage. She even paid for Delia's wedding ring. She also paid for the newlyweds apartment. But the marriage only lasted for two months and then Delia decided she was better off living with Arnold. In October 1981, just days before she was killed, Delia moved back in with Arnold. Then, on October 7th, Delia went missing. When Delia went missing, her estranged husband, Robert Ferreira, moved in with her ex-fiance, Robin Arnold. The police thought that this was kind of odd. The police found out that after Delia went missing, Arl continued to socialize with her friends. So the police interviewed Delia's friends. Several of them told the police that both Arnold and Ferreira had confessed to killing Delia. Arnold and Ferreira were arrested three days after Delia's body was found. They were tried together and their trial started in September 1982. There was no physical evidence that connected either Arnold or Ferreira to the murder. For example, the murder weapon had never been found. The prosecutor said that Arnold and Ferreira had developed a close relationship. Together, they conspired to kill Diane Delia. The prosecutor theorized that Arnold and Ferreira led Delia out to the woods where they shot her. Then they wrapped her body up in a blanket and they left her body in the woods. Two weeks later, Ferreira returned to the crime scene. He took Delia's body and dumped it in the river. The prosecution had many witnesses testify about the possible motive. Several witnesses testified that Arnold was jealous because she was madly in love with Delia and she wanted to be with her. Supposedly, on the night before the murder, Delia had sex with a woman and Arnold saw them together and she became enraged. Other witnesses testified that Arnold was jealous for an entirely different reason. They said that both she and Delia were vying for the affection of the same man. The man testified and he admitted to having sexual encounters with both Arnold and Delia. He said that one night they all went out with a group of friends. At some point in the night, he was sitting at a table between Arnold and Delia. They both put a hand on one of his legs without the other one knowing what the other one was doing. Delia's father testified. He said that just before Delia went missing, she had told him she was in an intimate relationship with both Arnold and Ferreira. Other witnesses testified that Ferreira was not attracted to Delia because of the sex change and he wanted Delia out of his life. Other witnesses gave the jury an entirely different motive. They said that Ferreira was angry that Delia had left him. One of the witnesses who testified was a man named Dominic Giorgio. He had dated Ferreira after Delia went missing. Giorgio testified that Arnold admitted to killing Delia twice while Ferreira had confessed to him on two different occasions. Before the trial, Giorgio had been in jail for stealing drugs from a hospital. While he was in jail, Ferreira sent him a letter. Someone stole the letter from Giorgio's cell and handed it over to the authorities. 
In the handwritten letter, Frere admits that they took Delia out to the woods. Frere wrote that Arnold shot Delia twice in the head and then he fired two bullets into her head. He wrote that he only shot her so he could put her out of her misery. In his closing statement, the prosecutor said that based on the witnesses' testimonies, it was clear both Arnold and Ferreira had several reasons to kill Delia. He said the most logical explanation was that Arnold and Ferreira talked to each other about their relationships with Delia. One of them convinced the other one, or they concluded together, that Delia no longer wanted to be romantically involved with either of them. So they hatched a plan to kill her. Because if they couldn't have her, then no one could. The prosecutor said that the case was simple. Diane Delia was killed by jealous exes. While Ferrer and Arnold were being tried together, they had different lawyers. Ferrer's lawyer argued that Ferrer was in the woods when Delia was killed, but he did not kill Delia. He said that Arnold had fired the first two shots, which killed Delia. Ferrer only fired two shots because he thought that Delia was already dead. His lawyer argued that shooting a dead body was not the same as murdering someone. The medical examiner testified that the first two bullets could have killed her. Neither Robin Arnold nor Robert Ferreira testified on their own behalf. The jury deliberated for three days. They ultimately decided that Diane Delia's estranged husband Robert Ferreira was guilty of second degree murder and her ex-fiance, Robin Arnold, was not guilty on all counts. In February 1992, Ferreira was sentenced to 20 years to life. He was paroled in August 2008. While Robin Arnold was on bail awaiting her trial, she started dating a dentist and they got engaged. After Arnold was acquitted, she said she planned on marrying the dentist. She even invited members of the jury to her wedding. Arnold said that she may go on to law school and become a defense lawyer because she was so impressed with her own attorney. It's unknown if Robin Arnold did any of the things that she said she was going to do. After she was acquitted of murder, she stayed out of the public eye. Thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you found that interesting. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it. Please check out criminallylist.com where you can suggest cases, buy merch, and find out about an exclusive podcast. We're also on Facebook at facebook.com slash criminallylisted. But that is all for today. Thank you again for watching.